Thank you, Dr. Veith. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, good afternoon again. I have no disclosures. I chair this uh, guideline committee for NICE. So we've known in the UK for some time that EVAR is unlikely to be cost effective uh, in aneurysm patients who are fit for open repair. But as I said earlier, we were keen to develop a new cost utility model using the most recently available uh, randomized and non-randomized clinical and economic data. This is published in May of 2018, and everything I'm going to show you this afternoon is in there, so there's nothing uh, new this afternoon. It's all been published for your scrutiny. We did this cost utility analysis. Uh, time this afternoon prevents me from going through this in detail, but it's all there for you to look at. But just to uh, say that the perioperative mortality, we used the UK National Vascular Registry, the Cochrane Review from 2014, and a new analysis from the European Registry VASCUNET from data provided to us by Professor uh, Manny. For the after 30 day mortality, we did a, or NICE did a new analysis of patient level data. I'm very grateful to Professor Greenhouse, Professor Powell, uh, and their colleagues for supplying these data. And we used UK population curves uh, from the EVAR1 period calibrated to reflect the EVAR1 population. And then NICE did a new uh, meta-analysis of the long-term data from EVAR1, DREAM, and OVA to look at the relative more long-term mortality between uh, EVAR and open repair. And then we uplifted those data to use uh, 2013 to 2015 UK population data because the general fitness of the UK population has actually increased quite a lot over those years, and we've assumed that that would be applied to aneurysm patients, especially as we have higher levels of best medical therapy treatment these days. So the point is that uh, EVAR is not the sole input to the base case, and we've also done extensive uh, probabilistic uh, sensitivity analysis and scenario analyses. So this is not a, a, a utility analysis based on the EVAR1 trial by any means. And what we have here is the NICE cost utility model overall survival. You can see the NICE base case in the dotted lines. As I said earlier on, uh, now in the UK, the great majority of patients survive their intervention, whether it's EVA or open repair. So it is increasingly the long-term outcome that determines overall survival. And as you can see, this is better with open repair in the NICE meta-analysis. And this means that the small health gains seen with EVAR in, let us say, the first four years of the model due to better perioperative survival and a smaller health-related quality of life impact of minimally invasive surgery, but over time, the superior long-term uh, mortality and let's not forget morbidity uh, seen with open surgical repair include, leads to an increasingly visible difference in cumulative qualities. And this uh, results in EVAR being dominated uh, by open uh, surgical repair. And EVAR would need to generate about 0.3 additional qualities per patient to have an incremental cost effectiveness ratio of 20,000, which is our threshold. So we have to go from minus 0.16 to plus uh, 0.32, let's say, uh, which uh, we would say is an implausible effect size uh, given what we know about the two uh, conditions, the two treatments rather. So again, if we do a PSA on this, we find that uh, we get an ISA of less than 20,000 pounds per quality in only 0.1% of simulations. And in the vast majority of cases, uh, open surgical repair dominates EVAR. And if we look at a cost-effective acceptability curve, you can see even if you double or triple um, your uh, willingness to pay threshold, you're not going to get a cost-effective outcome. So let's see what happens if we just uh, take out uh, the patients who are unlikely to survive for eight years. So we assume there's no difference in long-term mortality between EVAR and open surgical repair for eight years. And then we increase the hazard ratio for the post-perioperative survival compared to the general UK population. And so this models an increasingly unfit aneurysm population. So even when we take it to the very extreme and the hazard ratio is 15, so the patients are 15 times more likely to die, uh, the hazard ratio is 15 uh, compared with the UK general population, and only 1% of open surgical repair patients reach eight years, we still don't get um, uh, EVAR uh, being cost effective. 
And if we flex both the 30-day perioperative mortality and the long-term mortality, we can be highly certain that there's no plausible limit of simultaneously varying these parameters will get you an ISA of less than 20,000 uh, pounds per year. So in conclusion, Mr. Chairman, ladies and gentlemen, the nice cost utility model uh, in the draft guideline inputs data from all four randomized controlled trials and uses a lot of non-randomized sources. Although strengthened by them, the model outputs and the conclusions are not dependent on the late greater than eight year results from the EVAR1 trial. From a UK perspective, it is highly unlikely that EVAR is a cost effective option for aneurysm patients for whom open surgical repair is suitable. And it has not proved possible for us to identify a subgroup of patients for whom that is not the case. And I would also respectfully suggest it seems likely that the same will be true in other countries where the aneurysm population and the level of healthcare spending is similar. NICE have done a huge amount of extra analysis following the stakeholder, uh, but unfortunately I did not ask NICE if I could present this to you today, but it's embargoed until the final guideline is published. Again, I'd like to thank my colleagues on the guideline committee for their support over the last four to five years. Thank you.